uh, called order the ACSD uh, board meeting of October 12th. Uh, we'll start with introductions. My name is Mary Cullinane. Chip Malcolm. Jen Napier. Brittany Gilman, business manager. Kate Lou Steele, director of teaching and learning. Vicki Wells, director of student services. Mary Gill. Kyle Mitchell. Peter Burroughs, superintendent. Michaela Wizzle, assistant principal of Mary Hogan. Jen uh, Online. Lorraine Park. Uh, Victoria. Suzanne Moore. Suzanne Morris. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Suzanne Buck. Kristen Francoeur. Peter Conlon. Dory Jacobite. Andrew Conforti, interim principal at MUMS. Davina Sarah. Davina, could you introduce yourself? Yes, Davina Damery. Thank you. Sure. Uh, at this time, as always, we would like to provide the opportunity for the public to comment. Uh, as we have done in the past, uh, those folks who are on Zoom and would like to comment, please raise your Zoom hand. Uh, Peter will then. You want to read through the attendees first? Yeah. Or? Peter will then bring you in uh, and you'll be able to, uh, we'll be able to see you and you will continue to be able to see us. So at this time, Peter's going to let us know who is on as attendee. Barb Collette, Barbara Wilson, Hugh McLaughlin, Alana Brett, John Flowers, MCTV, and Tanya Scuteri. If any of those folks would like to make a public comment, please raise your Zoom hand. Right, Barb Wilson. Hi there. Um, we're together. So um, George wants to talk. George Gross, we only can do one connection because we don't have enough broadband um, throughput. Hi. Uh, this is George Gross uh, speaking informally um, in follow up to the proposal that the town had sent to you two weeks ago, uh, reminding you that um, we are watching uh, your. Uh, review of this process and uh, look forward to hearing from you, preferably in writing, uh, as to your response, either way that you go with it. And also I want to call to your attention uh, an item that might be overlooked in section four of the document that we sent uh, that specifically speaks to the structural issue that's been uh, thought to be there uh, by your architect at a true Collins. Two X columns, uh, and I want to hear from you your response, uh, preferably in and writing, about how uh, this matter is being handled, uh, including any supporting documents that describe roof. it. The roof. On the roof. That's it. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. That's it? Yep. Great. Um, so we have gotten away from this process in the flow for a little bit, which uh, has not, has been sad, <laughs> to be quite honest. Uh, it's been a highlight of being able to go around and have our meetings out of school and experience that differently. Uh, but we're going to make the best of what we have. And we have with us today, Mary Hogan. Great. So I'd like to introduce Jen Kravitz and Michaela Witzel, um, principal and assistant principal of Mary Hogan. Um, as you mentioned, today is Mary Hogan Day, and <laughs> normally we'd be celebrating Mary Hogan over at Mary Hogan and be, would be um, in the building and 
and with the community there. Um, unfortunately, we can't be, but um, this is the next best thing. So Jen is going to be talking a little bit and then I think introducing um, a couple of videos that some Mary Hogan students have put together to provide a lens into what's happening in Mary Hogan right now. Uh, thanks. So I think that um, the, I don't know if it was the last school you visited before COVID closed, but I feel like it was pretty it was. close to it that you came it to Mary Hogan and now it we're back. Was. So thanks um, <laughs> for having us so close. Um, so think of, um, I brought my little handwritten notes. So um, things have been great since the beginning of the school year. Like obviously there are bumps in the road, but teachers and students have been really remarkable. And they remind me every day that um, we're all incredibly resilient but also that um, we can care for each other more than we think we're actually capable of caring for each other. And the reason I feel like things are going so well is because we're all caring for each other really well. Um, people are obviously adapting to the health and safety guidelines and changes in most everything we do. It's just every part of the day is scheduled. And I'm sure that that's, you know, that's true across schools. Um, teachers are working to design for remote learners first, although not anymore because, well, for the one last week, three through six, right? Um, and really trying to figure out a model and how to roll it out and teach their kids. Um, and kids have gotten outside at every turn. Like we've seen kids outside for read aloud, for our literacy groups, for math, for number corner, for inquiry. It's they're outside a lot, um, and we have PE outside all the time. So the days that it was raining, there was PE outside. Um, and while it's probably, you know, it feels like what every, you know, other schools are doing, it feels different in a bigger school where there are just a lot more kids and there's a lot more outdoor space, but um, it's pretty awesome. So thank you so much again for the attempts that we have. Um, they're, they're great. Um, so in thinking about presenting to you, I was thinking about two highlights from the year. There's all these amazing things happening, but really wanting to focus on two things. One is twaddle, which um, you may or may not have experienced from like, as a parent or grandparent, caregiver. Um, so the second grade teachers at Mary Hogan really prioritized twaddle from the start of the year and have really kind of jumped right in. And they taught their students, they started using it even before the first day of school. They sent everybody like a text message before the first day, like, can you get on? Do you, you know? Um, so I feel like maybe, I don't know what you've heard about Toddle, but I figured if you heard from second grade students about what Toddle was like and saw it from their end, it may be helpful. So that's the first video. Go ahead, Will. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Kaiser. Can you make it bigger? How's it going? Good. Um, I was hoping you could help me today share with some adults on what Toddle looks like when you get in here to learn at home. Okay. Okay. So if we were to start your day um, at home, what's the first thing you usually do during to start your day with Toddle? I usually go to to the morning meeting and and listen to some other people's comments and then do mine. Awesome. Is it nice to get to check in with your classmates in the morning? Yes. Cool. Um, Kaza, how else do you know what your day looks like when you're at home? Well, pretty much it has the same. It, it's always like morning message, number corner, math, reading, and, and who we are. Is it, oh, and foundation. Yeah. Is it helpful that the day looks the same? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Kaisa, your day at home, all those things you just shared, mm-hmm. is that similar or different than what it looks like at school? Well, it's well, it's kind of similar because we. Because we always do morning meetings first, and mm-hmm. then number corner, and and then math, and then and then word work, and then we do reading, and then in the afternoon we do who we are. Oh, awesome, Kaiser! Can you on the computer? Would you mind scrolling through and kind of showing us those different parts of the day? Yeah. So I can I can see that morning meetings right there. What else? What happens when you scroll? And I have to scroll the opposite direction. There you go. There's also there's number corner, math, foundations, reading, uh-huh. and, and that's yesterday. Oh, so you can see like this is all just today, but you can see yesterday. Yeah. Can you show us that again? How it says yesterday. Yeah, go the other way. Oh, cool. So, and for yesterday's stuff, is it the same? Like, does the day still look kind of the same usually? Pretty much. Oh. But sometimes, like, math is on top or something. Oh, sometimes they're out of order. (laughs) Got it. But it's all usually still there. Do you have any other tools, Kaisa, that help you figure out what the day looks like? That's not, like, on title? Like, anything? You have a folder, right? Tell tell me about the folder. Well, the folders, like, are, like, Math and foundation stuff, are like, and and reading stuff are like all in the work for home folder, and then the number corner stuff are usually in the number corner folder, and Spanish stuff are usually in the Spanish folder. Cool. So the folders go with the work that's on your title. Yeah. Uh, is that helpful? Yes. And you get to use the folders at school too. Mm-hmm. Nice. Awesome. Kaza, thanks for helping us know how title looks when you sign in in the morning at home. Really, it must be feel really good to know what your day, whole day looks like, even when you're not at school. Mm-hmm. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Kaiza. Hi, David. Hi, Mrs. Lane. Um, David, I was hoping we could share with people how you start your day by doing the morning message in the morning meeting. Can you kind of show us how we would do that? Um, first, we find where it says morning meeting. Go ahead. You can do that. Click right on that morning meeting. And what does it look like once you're in here, David? Then it kind of looks like you have a share message. Cool. Then if you, and then when you log on, you'll find a message that the teacher posts. And then there's a volume button that um, the teacher can tell you what she's Oh, do should we listen to that? Yeah. Good morning, principal and second graders. Today is Friday, October 9th, 2020. Today is our last day in hybrid, and I'm so excited for our class community to come together next week. Today we'll practice make 10 facts using a dice activity. We'll also use a spinner to make words with glued sounds. Then see if they're real or nonsense words. During our reading mini lesson, we'll review how to use all the tools in our reading toolbox. I hope you have a fantastic, fun Friday. See you Monday from Mrs. Raymond. Check in. Share what you liked about the school week in Spanish. Me gusta, hmm, mine was, me gusta reading and solving problems and what would Danny do? So you can listen to the whole message. Uh-huh. Cool. All right. So then, David, what do you do after that? Um, we scroll down. Oh, and you can type a message in there. Uh-huh. Where do you find messages written by other people? You go to class discussion. Oh, and then what? What are you and doing here? Then you can look all around all these messages. <laughs> what do you do with them? You can hit the play button. Or you can hide them. Nice. So these ones are all only messages that you can listen to. These classmates uh-huh. only did that. Do you want to, can we click on those and just see what they said? Hi, seniors. The highlight of my week was getting to play on Hobson so you know my five-day class. 
about the other one? Hola, me llamo Kaiser. Me gusta playing on Hexon and reading. Sounds like you guys really like talk so this week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so David, how would you submit your answer to check in? Oh, you know what? Our picture is hiding it. Hold on, I'm gonna move our picture. All right, now that you can find your buttons, how would we um, share our our answer? We would go to this box, we would click on it, and we would type anything we want. Oh. And you can go over if you want. Well, little smiley faces, and you can put pictures of stuff. Oh, and what's the other part is? And there's a microphone button. So you can click on yes, and you can hide your message by word. Cool. So you could type your answer to the check-in, or you could show it with the emoji, with the pictures, or you could tell it with the microphone. Cool. So David, if we were to share our answer, what would we? Which way would you share your message? I would Probably share um me gusta hawk zone because I really like playing on hawk zone. So I'd probably go to the smiley face and put a hamburger. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, David, for sharing with us how we would do our morning message. It's helpful. Do you like getting to see the morning message by yes, your I do. Yeah, I know. It's pretty fun. Sometimes we do it in class and we you do get to do it at home, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, David. <laughs> Hi, Camden. Hi, Mrs. Raymond. I was hoping that you could show us what you would do if you were going to do number corner work at home on Toddle today. What would I that look like? That. Go for it. You have to scroll the other way. Oops. Okay. Oh. There you go. So, how would you find that? I would find it by scrolling down, going under the morning meeting. Okay. I click it and just do what I need to do. Awesome. <laughs> I might, we might need to click again. I didn't click you. Oh, I <laughs> All right. So, Kendall, once you're in here, how do you know what you're supposed to do? I hit the I read the instructions or I just hit the voicemail. Step one watch the video below to review making tens and to get directions on today's activity. Step two find your. So, whose voice is that? Back to Mrs. Biz. Oh, who's Mrs. Biz? She is the teacher next door. Oh, so she made this lesson. Cool. So then what, Camden? And then I hit the video, and when it's all done, I I go to respond, and as I done, yeah. and I hit turn it submit. Oh, because we didn't do anything, it's not letting us submit. And then I just hit yes, and then it's submitted. Cool. Camden, can you go back to the video? Tell me more about the video. What does the video do for you? It shows us, it shows me what to do. Can you scroll down a little bit so we can see? You gotta go the other way. I know, sorry. So if you click on that, it has a video. Yes. Can we click on it? Uh, um, the video disappears. Yeah, we disappeared. <laughs> okay, so that's, that's cool. So does it feel pretty easy to figure out uh -huh. what you're doing? Nice. Thanks for sharing that with us, Camden. Welcome. So um, hopefully the, you know, those second graders are just three random second graders whose parents said, sure, we can videotape my kid, you know, um, and um, they really represent what second graders can do on Toddle. And obviously kindergartners and first graders also are on Toddle, um, but it seems like the second graders are super proficient, and so it just felt important to share. Um, also, they're real characters. <laughs> David really loves hamburgers. Um, so um, the second video I want to share is from fifth grade. Um, I'm looking at their inquiry unit because they've changed it this year um, in all the best ways to think about COVID and getting outside more. Um, and so they're central. It's they're studying where we are in place and time. Um, and their central ideas are looking at like how history shapes our perspective and understanding of others. So they have all these investigations um, in class and focusing on journeys, but they really wanted to get kids out of class and think about their, like having their own journey and what would it look like. They worked with Troy Douglas, our PE teacher, to learn about orienteering and using compasses, and they integrated that into mapping. Um, 
So I talked with some fifth graders who are interested in talking with me um, to share a little bit more. I don't have access to this video, Jen. It's, oh. There's a permission. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. Hmm. Um, do you... Can I share it with you real quick? Yeah, yeah, go for it. Right. How do you want me to share it with you, Les? Um, like, so add an email or... Um, do you want me to... I can... Okay. It's fascinating that these, I had the other night would expect it. No, half the lingo would be good. I know what it is, yeah. but it's not in my head to use it. You got hamburger. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's all the, the use of the machine system. Yeah. They're so proficient, it's amazing. Yeah, and that's, it's really... we know that, and it's frightening. Yeah. But it's also. So I'm sharing it through Google Docs. Gives you perspective. So while, while they're working on this, just a quick, um, Mary helped me get an ish at an elementary update. So today was the first day we walked back to all students, you know, pre-K-2. Um, it was a really exciting day. So far, I like, to every principal yet, but I was, I just dropped by and this morning and walked down the wing on all the really exciting to see students coming back together to really tell like another first day of school for students and, and I think teachers felt that way too they were kind of approaching this not as okay just another day with more students but having to you know, set expectations again and and kind of it's a new group it's a it's a new kind of you know, start in some ways so um, anyway it was really uh, an exciting day yeah, I think they also got it, and they also had to think about like with double the students and double the desks. Like, how do we how do we do yeah. this? Um, and I think they're working through that. Um, okay. All right, shall we start? I think so. Okay. So far, like just the school year in general has been great. Like we got to go to Battel Woods multiple times. We also also got to go. We we sorry. Um, we we also had we, sorry we were also able to go down to um, Otter Creek and like launch boats into the river. Um, kind of about like journeys and traveling places and getting to places and where people live and if they want to move and. So we've been learning about that and doing some pro projects about it. We did uh, building boats and we brought in recyclable materials and brought them into school. And then we spent some time building some boats that we thought could float. And then we did a penny test and we could we saw how many pennies all of our boats could hold until they flipped over. And we were talking about why people would need to move places and that could be a way of journey and so then we brought them down to a little creek and we put them down some like little rivers and little waterfalls and we saw how they could if they could go down it a lot of our boats did good but some of ours flipped over when they went down so at the beginning of it we like we built boats out of materials, so we have like, so a bunch of people worked in groups and like some people would like make the boat itself and then other people would go and gather, gather like natural materials mm -hmm. so, to use. And when we launched the boats, some of them didn't work as well as the others. And we tried to make an anchor, and that didn't work because it was weighing down the boat a lot. So what we did is we built little boats out of like cardboard and plastic and bottles, and we had to bring a tape, and we all like taped it together, and then we put them down like rivers, put them in the water to see if they could float. <laughs> what did what was your boat made of? My boat was made of. Mine personally was made of like, so I had a bunch of bubble wrap on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I had like three tiles of like cardboard and then I put stuff on top of that. 
And did it work? Yeah, but then broke. <laughs> what do you think about being outside so much? It's really fun. Why? Like, because what's fun about it? It's just like outside's beautiful and the weather's, well, it's getting worse, but it was nice. Like, and fresh air and like going into the woods. Just like exploring and just having fun. So, um, about the woods. We went in the woods and we actually went to um, like a trail in Middlebury. And so we, when we went in the woods, we had to find a place to make a shelter because that was one of our journeys. And so we actually had to go there four times. And also like on another day, we had to go back there, but it was pouring rain. <laughs> and so that wasn't really, that was interesting. What did you do there when you were in the woods? So we um, had to find like materials to um, make the shelter. So what we did was that um, we kind of made a teepee sort of. Mm -hmm. It wasn't exactly a teepee. So that's something. Was it hard? It was a little tricky and difficult. What was tricky about it? Because some of us weren't working together. Mm -hmm. Like we just had some misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> we went out to the tow woods. We had to walk through the trail for a little while. Mm -hmm. That was kind of fun because we got to check out all the other forts that people built. Mm -hmm. And once we found our we, we once we found our spot, we got we got to start building. We, f we chose a rock and a tree right next to it. There was like a branch and we found a stick to lean up against the rock in the tree. And, and we kept putting sticks over it. Mm -hmm. And then we started on a diff on the other side. And we, so we put a V sticks um, and then started laying this, the sticks across the rock. So to map out the uh, like, oh, uh, what was it? Uh, map out our fortress, okay. our little uh, forts. And uh, yeah. Was it hard to use the compasses and hard to figure out how to use them? No, once you got the hang of it, it was pretty much easy peasy. And what did you, so you said you used them to map out your fortresses. What did that look like? Did you draw the, draw things or well, tell have, me more about that? Uh, uh, our teacher, Mrs. Corbett, mm -hmm. she like, uh, she gave us uh, little uh, journals mm -hmm. and we had like a clipboard and we were like, it was raining, so it was kind of hard because the paper kept on everything, but we would write down the coordinates. So like what we would do is we would like, so we would like, you would count how many steps you're going and then you would flip to the way you're going. And then you could, then you would jot it down. And then you would do that again until you got to your purpose. Well, I think the point of all this stuff is so that we can learn strategies to work well together and also so that we can learn what works and what doesn't work. Yeah, we can, um, sorry, we can, so we have that like real life experience, but we're still having fun and we're learning at the same time. It's just an objectively better way to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so um that was that those were all their words they didn't have a great deal of preparation that was just kind of them reacting to telling me about what they were doing and i've been following along you know through emails and seeing where they were going and talking with them along the way but um it felt like an, a really great opportunity to highlight things that hadn't happened in the past, like they hadn't gone outside and done these same activities in the past, but because of wanting to get kids out of the building more and do more outside learning, it was this opportunity to explore more. Um, so those are just two slices of life at Mary Hogan. Um, you're welcome to come anytime. You're welcome to hold your board meetings or whatever. It's a bigger space. I don't know if that's appealing, um, but yeah, no, I feel like it's it's been a good year. Um,
for sure has been a different year. It's been, it's been a good year. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, and I'm sorry. It, it felt a little odd to have kids come via Zoom, and it was a little late for second graders. So. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's totally yes. Yes. Any questions? I, I have a comment. I hope you know when we when we get through this radical change that maybe principals or somebody along the way can continue with contemporaneous notes to themselves about how things are working. Not that do we need to hopefully do the same thing again, God forbid, but because there seems to be always a silver lining in certain parts of it. And it struck me by just by the second graders and how they responded to the computer. I'm not saying that just generated that everyone was on the same level, but in fact, there are parts to it that are beneficial, um, obviously disruptive, but I would hope we can put that together at some point in the leaders of the school can sort of and encourage you to do that because you may when we get back to normal whoever knows when that will be it may be helpful to sort of reflect on that yeah i mean i feel like this year is, is this opportunity to like make choices and to try new things so that we are planning like planning forward so if you're given to as so i feel like this year when i have these decision points and the same is true for teachers. I hope we're making choices that are where we want to head so that we may get back to normal in terms of health and safety, but the education right. isn't going back to the way it was. Like that's we're right. in that's the right. midst of this. That's what I mean. I, I yeah. think, I mean, in my, uh, but, but I agree with you. I think that make, you know, writing it down, but also having um, staff reflect on it feels really important also because I think that they'll be thoughtful about the causes that are are coming out of it also. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Any questions from the folks online? Great. Well, I got to tell you, I don't think I've heard anyone say this has been a great year as it relates to 2020. So congratulations for, I mean, just that mindset speaks so highly of what those kids get to experience every day. And so Sirius, thank you very much for, for pulling that all together, man. That's awesome. Really good. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not always easy, right? But it's never always easy. Exactly. But generally, it's really good. Oh, it's just a great mindset. Thank you. Yeah. I just have one comment too. I think what I've noticed is, you know, in the past, kids would sort of be really excited about the first month of school and then things would sort of wane a little bit. They are excited to be there. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are so appreciative of the fact that they can now go to school. Yeah. Where in the past they kind of took it for granted. So, and wow. Yeah, we heard that in the spring. Like, there are students who are like, I just want to go back to school. Yeah. So, you know, students who weren't super like engaged in school, yeah. and they're all, I mean, I think teachers all asked their classes, How are you feeling about coming back? And yeah. they all were like, Yeah, I am excited. And yeah. I would say we had. Um, like 10% of our students who are learning remotely and through the hybrid. And at this point, I think we're down to 2% um, mm -hmm. who are in the remote academy. So like they're coming back. Right. Um, so we're very excited about being back at school. Mm -hmm. That's a nice yeah. perspective. Thank you. I also want to say um, a huge thank you to the teachers. Uh, so far, I'm speaking for my five-year-old. Um, all the time and effort they're put into um, organizing um, like packages for kids when they're starting remotely. It's you know everything's so organized, <laughs> and they put a lot of thought and time into it. And I I just want to appreciate that. The other thing I want to appreciate is the traffic flow. <laughs> mm. It's been going really well so far. But Mary Hogan. <laughs> I don't know about the other school, but yeah. So thank you for that. So I I think we're gonna make a slight adjustment to the agenda so that we're just gonna be a little bit more efficient with um, folks who are here. Brittany, do you want to do the approve the McGilton fund request now. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the yes. Great. Okay. So the McGilton fund is um uh where Mary Hogan is a beneficiary of that as a trust fund, and typically we would bring requests um in the spring or in the winter or spring, like February March, 
um, for the following school year, but we didn't do that because there was so much in the air. And so um, what we're doing now, and we're, Jen and Michaela can speak to their request there, um, doing a partial request. We usually have you know around twenty five thousand um, dollars in a distribution to spend. Um, so I'll, I'll let Jen and Michaela talk about the request and why they're doing it this way. Um, sure. So um, it feels like it's a year where um, I can't think too far in advance. Mm -hmm. I hope that we can send kids to Keek, but I know that we're not doing field trips. You know, so it's like that type of stuff. So. Um, Brittany and I talked in the summer, well, we talked throughout the spring and then into the summer that um, going forward this year, there would be requests that we might come in as we see them. So the first request is to, um, so I guess what Chip was saying earlier, there are these silver linings and trying to make decisions that um, are durable and support the systems in our school. And so the first request is to fund some outdoor desks um, and benches that are exactly what Salisbury built with the hopes that that is one piece that will last beyond COVID and really expand the outdoor learning opportunities at, at Mary Cogan. There are a lot of teachers who are thinking a lot about it, um, but infrastructure is like, is a limiting factor. Um, we have tents, but we have to bring our chairs out every time, you know, so um, just trying to think about that. Um, and the second one was for PE, and actually there will probably be a, another request from PE because they're really, now that we're back, um, thinking about their units. And in the past, they've dealt, gone swimming with second grade, first and second grade, and they've gone, um, they went cross country skiing last year and things like that, but they, um, and they've done rock climbing and that all can't happen so easily this year. So um, they wanted to do archery. And because that is something that we could do, we could get um, a number of different bows. Um, and um, Troy knows a lot about what to look for. So they're not just like your um, Peter Pan in the woods um, arrows. They're pr um, pretty extensive with pulleys um, that will make it easier and more accessible for kids. Um, so those, I think, were the two requests. Am I missing a request, Brittany? Um, materials to support outdoor play. Oh, and then, sorry, yes. And then the other piece was um, really just in allowing classes to find the, the outdoor play pieces that are going to support them the most um, based on what they needed. So, um, and, and allow classes to get the materials rather than share them as a grade, which is what they've done historically in the past. And so the total amount of the request is 8050 dollars. Um, I think it's likely that we actually won't need to ask the trust to, to disperse these funds. We have some leftover funds from last year that we weren't able to utilize. Um, so this is really just letting the board know that there's a purpose for these funds and asking for approval to utilize the funds this way. And then we'll come back later in the year and see how much you know money we have left in our disbursement and request more. Great. So I have a motion. I'll make that motion to approve or approve that expenditure. So we have a motion on the floor to approve the fund request as shared in the October 12th letter. Second? Yes. Second. We have a second. Uh, any questions or comments from anyone? One quick comment. Most of the monies in the other years, at least in the recent past, have gone to fund some of the uh, activities that you waived. Yeah. Is that correct? That's true. And um, I don't know if that will be possible no, this I'm, year. I'm just, yeah. I'm just putting in a reference. It was, for the, yes. For Most was for QAIDEN as well as for PE. Those yeah. were the two large expenditure lines. Yeah. Yeah. A second was by Jen. All those Jen, in favor? Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Show of hands on TV. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Any nays? Great. So approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is to approve or recommendation to approve the minutes of the September 28th board meeting. Sure. Jen has a motion to approve. 
Second. Second by Mary. Any comments, questions, or concerns? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Raise your hand on TV. <laughs> Thank you. Any nays? So approved. Perfect. Uh, next up, approve the ACSD bill. We have one set of bills read today uh, since our last meeting, and it's in the general fund. A total number of five hundred and seventy-three thousand three hundred and fifty-five dollars and eighty-nine cents. And I uh, make the motion that we pay the bills. Second. 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 By Victoria. Great. Any questions? All those in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any nays? So approved. Next up. Report of the superintendent. Great, thank you. Uh, so I just mentioned earlier, uh, today was uh, our pre-K two um, welcome. And um, I think if you read through the board report, you'll see that, you know, at every school, um, you know, principals have been really focused on getting settled with protocols, um, kind of getting into a routine. I think the, the timing of moving to fully in person for elementary was really a, a good timeline for us in terms of becoming comfortable with the two days a week and getting used to things with half the students in. It is an adjustment bringing students back. That's why we're phasing it in um, with half of our students um, this week and then the other half next week. And um, Wednesdays being a half day, we're going to be using the other half of that day for deep cleaning and, and other work related to COVID preparation and the, the elasticity that Jen mentioned in terms of planning far ahead and, and needing to have time to be working together as a staff to um, take care of all the needs that we have during the, the pandemic. Um, the, the two main things um, on my report tonight, one is the mom's sixth through eighth grade transition and wanted to give the board an update as we start moving towards budget season to start talking about how that process is going. Um, as you all know, uh, after the decision a summer, two summers ago, um, the mom staff have been working. Um, there's been a, a, a small group that's been um, working with the larger faculty in, in creating um, different models to look at. Um, so they are now at version 3.0 and Chris and Andrew, and potentially I, I see a couple other mom staff members. I'm not sure if the others will be joining them, so we'll find out soon. Um, they've prepared a slideshow to talk about the work that they've done, um, kind of some of the methodological backings of the decision-making they've had. Uh, as you know, uh, one of the things that we've been talking about, um, and this really is a conversation that's been going on for many, many years, is as our student population has gone down, we've had this kind of, how do we design within a team structure with the, the student body with 120 students? It was a lot easier when our numbers were up at 180, but as the numbers have shrunk down, uh, it's, it, get, it has gotten harder and harder in terms of the, um, the cost. And so, um, you know, the, the staff and um, with Chris leading, leading, leading that process has been looking at how, how do we maintain what we need, welcome the sixth graders, you know, really kind of build a model that's grounded in, in I think, what makes moms a great school um, and do it within the constraints that we have. Um, so she's gonna talk a bit about that too. Um, Chris, are you there? I am here. Awesome. Does Will have the screen up for us? He doesn't yet. He, I see it here. Do you want right. to maybe just share Let screen right share. from there? Yeah. Chris, if this doesn't work, I think you can probably just share your screen too. I don't think I can because I'm actually, the screen is up on my phone right now. So my phone is not connected to the meeting. Oh, okay. But it looks like Will is now on, so hopefully you are getting to see it. Now. Will, we will definitely get it up there momentarily. 
So while Will is doing that, um, this is model 3.0. It actually is probably more like 8.0, but we refer to it as 3.0. And I know in the background, um, Alana and Barbie and Andrew, at least, are here. And so at any point, if they want to jump in and share, I hope they will. Um, well, I can, I just, just as a note, I can, um, so we, we now have the screen here. Yep. You can do it there. Um, so, um, Ilan or Barb, if you want to come over, can you raise your hand and then I'll know. I'm sure they will. Yeah, I've got, I'm, well, let's see. Barb is coming over. Great. So if Will wants to go to the next screen, and which is the process, up, yeah. great. So during the last school year, we met um, sometimes, multiple times a month, but we met throughout the entire school year, a small team um, representative of various groups within the building. And we put together possible models. Each time we discussed a model, the model was then brought to our school leadership team, um, to the counseling group, and also to the team leaders. Um, the models were varied. They relied on some models that had been developed in the past. And then we eventually threw those completely out the window and developed what we referred to as version 2.0. Version 2.0 back in the spring was vetted through the entire faculty. And at that time, the faculty did send a letter to the board expressing their concern about the overall number of students that each of the, um, what it, in the past we referred to as the Mills teachers, the math, uh, math science, individuals and societies and language and literature teachers would be teaching. And that in that 2.0 version, that we would also be losing some instructional time. After that discussion with the board, we went back with that 2.0 and went back to the drawing board. We surveyed the faculty and staff. We also then met with people and held multiple meetings. And what we came to was that we had sort of two ways the road could we could travel. One was that we could um, lessen the number of students that those teachers taught. But if we did that, that would in effect dissolve teaming at MUMS. And overall, our faculty survey was unequivocal that the teachers felt it was more important to maintain a team system, a TA system at MUMS, both of which are paramount in a middle school model. That At that point, we arrived at what we refer to now as version 3.0. This version does increase the amount of class time in those classes, but it does not address the overall number of students. And again, this was based upon going back to the entire faculty and surveying them, um, saying we can't have it all. We can't have small numbers of students that we teach and maintain things with the current budget situation. So we therefore went forward with 3.0. We again vetted it multiple times through the faculty in the spring, held informational meetings and also shared it through central office um, and with the IB coordinator for MYP, Courtney Cron, to make sure we were meeting all of the things we needed to in all our different areas. So if Will could move to the next slide for us. So this version 3.0 has two, um, uh, really it does again give us more instructional time, but it also in it, um, we put an increased emphasis on literacy support. Our test results are, um, assessment results over the years have shown that we do need to continue to work very 
very in a very focused manner on literacy. And so this uh, 3.0 looks at both of those. In this model, there would be one team for each sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade. Each of those teams would have their own uh, math teacher, their own language teacher, individuals in societies, mathematics, science, and a PE health teacher. The teams would be about 120 students. However, in doing that, class sizes would not exceed 20 students. So we kept with a really nice size for classes. In this model, it, we would also sixth grade, when you came in in sixth grade, you would loop for sixth grade and seventh grade. So have the same group of teachers for two years and have a standalone group of teachers for eighth grade with the idea that we would be promoting independence and readying students for the high school. In this model, um, it does call for a staffing of 35 FTE teachers, which is a 2.5 increase over where we are right now. However, having said that, we would be teach taking an, in an entire additional grade of students. So we were very pleased that we were able to keep the increase in staffing to just that small amount. Um, it would be an increase of music teachers. And we also were looking for um, three of our language acquisition, our what we used to call world language and what we used to call way before that, our foreign language teachers would be dually certified in both French and Spanish. So students would be able to pick the language which is required by MYP. Um, we would continue to offer all interventions as we always have, but we would also continue to make sure that those interventions did not pull students out of any of their other classes. Um, and so students, besides having all of their normal classes, one of the things we are most excited about is that on Wednesdays, we would have a more flexible schedule on Wednesdays. And in that time, we would work on our interdisciplinary units, which are, are an integral part of MYP. And we also would be working with students on social emotional learning and have time for students to have some exploratories. And so we liked that, that flexibility on Wednesdays um, to give students a different learning experience. The other piece that I didn't mention, which we also are very, very excited about, is this is what is referred to as a waterfall schedule, meaning that Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, students would have um, their classes in a different time of day each day, with the brain research on middle schoolers saying that if you get to see them at different times during the week, at least once, you get them at their best learning time instead of um, like with my own children, if you had them first thing in the morning, they weren't going to learn a whole lot in that class. So this is a, the schedule moves. Um, so students get to learn in all subject areas at their best time of day, at least once a week. If Will wants to switch to the next one. And again, um, as I said earlier, 3.0 is exceedingly uh, similar to 2.0 with the, the changes that there is more curriculum seat time over the course of the year and there is a much, a much higher emphasis on literacy support. If Will wants to open the link, we won't ask you to try to understand this link right now, uh, but this is how complicated such a schedule looks. Sorry, Will. Okay. I'm a little trouble seeing the map. Oh, he's not there yet. I need access. Oh, to I'm sorry, Will. Okay. We will send you the link to that because I apologize. I'm not sure. Maybe if Alana is on right now, she might be able to share it out. I don't know. So if Will wants to switch to the next one, oh, maybe Andrew can. Okay, I just lost something there. <laughs> Hold on, Chris. I think I closed the window by mistake. Okay. Chris, I was right there. I threw the window. 
It's your show where you see the presentation. Mm -hmm. right? Your 2014, eight seconds left. <laughs> and Andrew has just shared that link, so Will should be able to click on it. You want to look at that first, Chris? Sure, please, Will. Thank you. Yep. All right, can you see that? I can. Blue, green, red. Now, 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 it is exceedingly complicated. What you really need to understand is um, that each of the three grade levels would have a schedule grade specific. They would each receive each of their um, core content areas across the MYP throughout the day in a waterfalling manner over, um, over the course of a week. Alana, are you on? I am. Alana, could you explain how the sixth grade, you explain it much better than I do, how the sixth grade works, for example, a student schedule. Okay, so the sixth grade is the, I suppose we'd call it pink. Um, and they have six blocks in a day um, of classes. So we start every day in TA. Um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, just 10 minutes in TA. And then they would rotate through um, this. So on day one, a student might have Lang and Lit first period. Every period is 49 minutes long. Um, they might have math block two. They might have um, language arts or PE health or STEM or art, any of those. So. There are six, uh, there are eight classes that they can have, um, and they have six a day. So here, it, that therein is the waterfall portion of it. Um, in the middle of the day, there are three lunch periods. Uh, classes eat by grade. Um, during that time, a student might have band or choir or intervention. Um, or language arts, or an on-team study hall, or what we're calling an, an open art. So students that have interventions would then have a chance to take their, um, what we now call mixed team class, their art or digital, um, or, or um, art or digital, I think is where we ended up with that during that time. Um, it's hard, I don't, it, it's, I mean, it's hard enough explaining our current schedule without confusing people. So to try to explain this, I'm hoping I'm not confusing people more. Um, but within the rotation of a week of Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, students have each of their classes three times. Um, and then Wednesdays are, as Chris said, a different day. We have a half hour for TA because um, we value TA very much at the middle school level. 10 minutes is barely enough time to get through the announcements and take attendance. So i um, very excited that we will have 30 minutes with our TAs on Wednesday. Um, and then there'll be an interdisciplinary block. There are two interdisciplinary blocks during the day. Uh, there are also skills for life, uh, which is our social emotional learning. And it's been a real challenge for us. We have wonderful, wonderful things being presented um, with our social emotional learning right now, but no good time in our schedule uh, to present that to students. Um, so this is a great addition. And then we're also offering on Wednesdays exploratories. So uh, teachers will offer different topics of interest. Students can sign up for those. Exploratory could also possibly be a study hall time. Um, the one diff major difference for sixth grade than any of the other teams is that our hope is to hire a duly certified language teacher and that sixth graders would do uh, like a carousel of language where they would be exposed to both Spanish and French. And therefore, our hope is that they would have um, 
it'd be able to make a more informed decision by seventh grade of what language they want to pursue there on in. Um, I think that's the, the best I can do without trying to get make it too complicated. And Barbie, I know you're there. If there's anything you want to add, please do. That was great, Alana. Thank you. Barbie, chime in if you'd like. Um, Will, if you want to go to the next screen, we'll explain how we're going to staff this. So in looking at the staffing model for this, again, we are looking um, for four language acquisition teachers, three guidance counselors, adding one gui guidance counselor to have a guidance counselor per grade, four special educators, um, one for each team, and then one specifically to help us meet our literacy concerns. And then SEL and SOAR, which is a separate reading intervention uh, program, which we already have, math reasoning, uh, which we continue, which we have had, and a library and media library media specialist. Really, the middle column is the column where we're talking about most um, change, in that we are proposing a return to having a full-time STEM teacher and adding, um, having choir go from 0.2 FTE to uh, 1.0 FTE to make sure that students, any student has ample opportunity to engage in music and that our music ensemble um, class times aren't as insanely large as they have been. And in order to make all those positives and growth happen in staffing areas, um, in our final column, you see that we are proposing going from three of each of these core content um, subject teachers are from four down to three. And so it is a slight, a 2.5 FT increase in staffing overall in the building, but it is um, sort of moving, uh, moving roles around in order to meet the um, programmatic needs in this schedule. Will, if you want to go to the next slide, and there will be time for questions, I promise. Um, again, some of our highlights, and I won't read all of these, um, you know, class sizes do not exceed 20 students. It maintains teams, looping at sixth, from sixth to seventh grade, TA, team meeting time for adults to maintain, um, uh, I see Suzanne's question, Absolutely, positively not. Suzanne's question is, do we, are we maintaining that uh, students with special ed are able to have music? Absolutely. Um, we have made sure that, they, that students who are on support plans do not lose anything as they get their services. Um, teachers have one grade level of prep, even though they are teaching a large number of students. They are not teaching multiple grade levels. Um, all classes have the same amount of class time, which has not historically been the case. Um, this means that um, for the last year, uh, last two years, frankly, PE has barely made our minute requirement for MYP. We are now remedying that. Design hours, which have been absorbed by science, would be running on their own, um, which would be wonderful. As Alana said, Skills for Life allows for SEL learning, but not um, sort of trying to shoehorn it in anywhere and everywhere. It allows for all students to get it in a consistent manner. Um, we can do this plan in the space we have without needing to come to you to ask for an addition or renovations. And, um, it also allows right now interdisciplinary units are sort of shoehorned in where and when we can do them. This allows for that in a much more streamlined, much more effective manner. Uh, Will, if you want to jump to the next. Again, as, as Alana said, on Wednesdays, we would have longer TA time. 
Um, it can be traditional TA time or also be UPC meetings. Um, and then the interdisciplinary block. Um, and that um, we are very, very excited about that ability to do that well. Uh, next slide, Will. And, you know, this is just an overview of how the interdisciplinary project would work. And um, it, it allows, as we build these projects, uh, right now, finding the planning and the instructional time to do it is very, very cumbersome. And um, we have not felt that we have been able to do it to the best of our ability. And this allows it to be um, with dedicated time that is not taken from other classes. Well, if you want to go to the next, which I think is almost the last. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, this is the fourth special educators role, which we do feel is exceedingly important. Um, this is to look at language and communication across all content areas. And that while each grade level would have a special educator dedicated to that grade team, the fourth special educator would work cross team to make sure we are catching those students who are struggling in literacy, that we are trying every which way through SOAR, through special educators, through our Lang and Lit teachers, but this is another way to meet such, a, such an important need. And the next slide, please. And then because, you know, as we do these things, we wanted to look at what this means in terms of time. This is a breakdown of um, what time would look like at the middle school under this model. Each teacher would be teaching, would have six sections of classes where they would meet with them um, in three sessions in each week. Um, we have enrichment classes. Prep and planning, which really is their personal planning time, the beginning and end times for planning um, as guaranteed by the contract, TA times across the week, and team meeting times. Team meetings are, um, I cannot stress the importance of them enough at the middle level. It means that the teachers meet five times a week to talk about their shared group of students allowing for shared information and collaboration to make sure we're meeting students' needs. And then, of course, everybody needs to eat lunch. And so that is uh, where version 3.0 is right now and, you know, is the model that we hope we will be able to move forward in our planning. And then the last slide is any questions. <laughs> Hey Chris, this is Mary Cullinane. Thank you very much for um, taking the time to share this with us. One question I have on the STEM resource. Could mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about the thinking around having the STEM be a unique resource compared to that being an integrated approach that's found within those other similar teaching categories? Content sure. categories? Um, the, there are pieces inherent right now, we have a design teacher. And in the past, we did have a STEM teacher separately at months. That was one of our cuts several years ago. And right now, the design hour requirements under MYP cannot be met just with our design class under our current schedule. And so right now, students take design where they learn the MYP design pieces, but also the information technology pieces um, set forward in the district's technology plan and also uh, required by the state. And so right now we are squeezing every possible minute out of science to give um, extra hours for design that we are fitting into science. And it's not working. It's not the science curriculum is so rich on its own and has such requirements. We're, we're doing a disservice to science and to design in trying to make the best of a situation that is not quite manageable. And by bringing back STEM separately, it allows for design to have all of the depth 
intensity and richness that it has. And our students are so fascinated by STEM. And this gives a way to make sure that we can really explore this. Thank you. Yep. Other questions? Jen? Thanks for sharing this. It's really exciting to see it come into uh, reality. It sounds as though you're addressing some concerns and some, um, some maybe weaknesses that you've seen over the years and trying to make some improvements in addition to the, the six through eight, which is great, right? It's not just how do we get sixth grade and it's how do we improve the entire middle school experience. And it's exciting to hear about it. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about how the faculty have responded to, to um, version three. The faculty haven't really, um, in the last two months, um, have not reacted to 3.0 much because they've had so much else on their plates. Right. Having said that, Andrew and I now are getting emails from people requesting um, that they would like to be considered to teach at particular grade levels or in particular roles. Um, in the spring, um, when we crossed the bridge that was, we want we want to keep two grade level teams for each grade. And therefore, in order to do that, we need to greatly increase the faculty and the building size. When we moved from there to some of those things are not possible in the world where we are right now, um, we did hear excitement about aspects of the plan. Although change is hard, and especially to consider a change this large in the middle of adapting to a COVID world is exceedingly, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of brain space being used right now. Um, but I am excited about the number of people who just in the past week have reached out after Andrew addressed this model in the faculty meeting last week, people who have reached out um, especially excited about teaching sixth grade, which was great to hear. Thank you. Chip? Yeah, what, what's the biggest challenge, uh, Chip Malcolm, uh, what's the biggest challenge that you have to develop uh, next? The people. I mean, realistically speaking, in this model, there will be colleagues, friends, data team partners who have been in our building and are part of our school family who based upon this model and licensure may no longer be with us. And that is a painful reality for any of us to wrestle with. And I think there's also the piece of we have not yet reached a point of fully understanding what it will mean in terms of whether we will have people transitioning into the middle school or not from, a, from, from the elementary schools. And I think to me, the biggest thing I hear from the adults is a concern about how their own lives and how their lives of their colleagues will be impacted. Thank you. That's frank assessment that I would expect. Mary? Um, Chris, it's Mary Gill. Um, I have a question about PE and health. Are those now going to be combined? In the past, yes. they were separate? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and how many days in a week will they have that combined? They will have PE health, which is a combined class, as much as they have every other class. And so, um, I, Alana, I'm looking at you because I can't remember how many times they normally have each class in a week. I think it's three. Three 49-minute uh, class periods. Actually, an increase over what we have. Well, it's an increase over their PE now. Um, but when you combine PE and health, it's, it's nearly the same because they'll have 
health for one quarter, or at, at right now they have health for only one trimester and PE all through the year. But to go to Chip's point about addressing past problems, um, in the past two years, our PE blocks have been much too short. It is very problematic to try to get middle schoolers who don't move quickly unless they want to be somewhere to get them into the gym and ready to go and really um, have enough time to do the sort of learning that the PE teachers have wanted to do. And this addresses that. And can I also just say that um, as we were switching into hybrid and then as recently as last week, our PE teachers, um, they're just really excited. Uh, they wish they could have started teaching kind of PE wellness this year and even still right now. Um, so I think it's gonna be, a, a. I mean, and they've talked about just how they would do that and the value of that. And um, I think it's a good move. Lorraine? Um, Chris, I apologize if you answered this and I didn't understand it, but I think you mentioned, I have two questions actually. One is, I think you mentioned that this version is gonna give you increased seat time. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how you did that and how you got more seat time this, with this new version and what was, where was it before or? you know, how you were able to do that? That's my first question. Okay, I'm gonna to look to Barbie or Barbie and Alana because there was a, a lot of things that went in and then went out in order to make that happen. I think one place that the seat time increased is by moving an interdisciplinary unit time onto Wednesday. That actually will be, um, it will be considered core time for the classes that are in that interdisciplinary unit. So that gives them some time back. So something you might have been addressing in your Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday classes, you now have a designated time on Wednesday to address that. Okay. Um, and my other question is, and I think when last year it came, I am assuming from Peter, um, that there was not going to be any increase in staff with the sixth grade moving over. So I'm wondering, and I don't know whether that was decided between you, Chris, and Peter, that that could be done or that was, you know, who made the determination that you're saying that you think you need an additional two and a half faculty members. And so I'm just wondering um, what the, you know, Sure. how that's coming from it, you know, how the administration feels about that, the central office, I guess. The, well, Lorraine, I'll, I'll, I'll answer how that happened and then let Peter answer how he feels about it. Um, the, we went into this process trying over and over and over to not have any FTE increase over where we were. And what we found as we worked that through it was, it was conceivably possible, but, and, and, and I'm gonna try to, however, in doing that, we were going to take our most vulnerable students, our students who are our struggling learners and are at risk students, and they were going to be denied access to some classes in order for them, if we kept to exactly where we are now, those students were going to have to be pulled out of um, music or language acquisition or art for those things in order to give them their services and their interventions. And I, as I have said to many of you who have known me a long time, I was a struggling math student. And if I had been pulled out of my langu world language classes to do my math intervention, I would have dropped out of high school. And I cannot stress strongly enough how much I personally and professionally feel that our students who are struggling learners need to have access to everything. And that gave us a 2.5 FTE increase. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, I was kind of, at the time wondered how, how it would work without additional people. I was a little concerned about that. And that, I mean, to me, 2.5 people seems very reasonable, but I'm just wondering, I mean, I'm not an administrator or, you know, in the situation, obviously. So I'm wondering if Peter wants to weigh in on that. I, someone asked me how I feel. Well, I mean, I'm just, I mean, originally, you know, we were told, no, they're going to be able to do it or they're going to have to do it with yeah. no additional staffing. So I'm just, you know. So, I mean, I think it, it it's a, you know, we, when Chris and I talked about kind of the approach in terms of building the model, um, you know, we've been talking about staffing at Moms for many, many years. I mean, my first year here, Beauty 3 board um, had a very long drawn out budget process. You probably remember. Yes, I um, do. There. Where, where Patrick brought out the, you know, we had seen declining enrollment at, at Moms and, um, he had worked, I believe, with staff at the time to put together a model that shrunk the teams down to three. And part of the challenge we have when you keep teams, and I think Chris articulated this really well, when you keep teams, um, it, it's really hard to adapt to, to enrollment change unless those teams are fluid and those teachers teach beyond one team. So it's, it, it's either, I mean, and, and that's kind of, I think the challenge we've had in, in, in considering going from two teams to one team or 1.5 teams, uh, you start to give up certain things. And I think Chris talked about this as well. Like you, you can't have every single thing. And if you do, in terms of our current numbers at 115 or so, you know, our, our previous numbers, when, when we first started responding to the enrollment decline of moms, back, like I said, eight years ago, um, those, those class sizes were up probably around 160 or more, um, you know, depending on the year. So as those have come down, we haven't done a commensurate, we haven't been able to really do a commensurate shrink. The only place you can really shrink when you have those teams is, is around kind of like non quote unquote essential. And I think every position is essential when, we, when we're staffing schools. Um, so I think that that has been a challenge in, in kind of figuring a way forward, keeping the teaming structure intact, which I think um, if you talk to anyone, um, they'll say that one of the greatest strengths of moms has been the, the teaming and everything that happens out of teams. And it, you know, Chris talked about the, the team time. Um, you know, the, the staff that work on teams are really connected. Um, they're talking about both instruction, they're talking about student wellness, they're talking about everything. And they're, they're kind of in some ways the engine that, that runs the middle school. So that, that in and of itself is a really important factor. And I know in um, kind of following the process that Moms has done and taken over the last year and a half now in looking at different models and and looking at this and looking at that, like there's no magic. The magic number is not like straight staffing or not straight staffing. It's not an exact thing. Um, I, I think what we're looking at is trying to acknowledge that if we if we did sustain two teams at Moms and kept all these all the other positions, it would be a lot more expensive than than almost any other middle school, for one. Um, two, we're at the excess spending threshold. So if, if we don't respond there, we're gonna have to, with that increase in cost, we're gonna have to cut somewhere else. So we're now in a position, I mean, this is what's been driving our facilities master planning conversations of late is we're in a position where we're, we're now going to, and you, you saw it in the paper last week from Mount Abe, um, who are going through the exact same process we are, they're at the spending threshold and they're struggling to figure out where do we, how, how do we make this all work? So I think it's complicated. So, I mean, I'm not sure how, how I feel is, I think we're facing, um, because we're again up at the excess spending threshold, we're facing times where we have to really work together to figure out how do we maximize our resources 
and to the benefit of the most students and and create structures that our staff, our communities, um, and our students can really get behind. So, I mean, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but I mean, obviously this has been presented to you, Peter. I mean, this isn't the first time you've seen this new plan, correct? No. Okay, so knowing that we have spending thresholds and knowing that you had hope that we would not add any additional staffing and with this new model Chris is saying we would need an additional two and a half people uh are you saying that you aren't happy with this particular model or I mean I I'm just wondering you know I I'm if this is what they need for this model are you saying that you think that there should be some additional looking to change this model or? No, no, I'm not saying that at all. What I was saying was the, the initial beginning of this process in designing was we had to look at how do we build a model within some kind of parameter, right? Right, yes. And you could say, you could tell me, design a school district, don't think about money, just design a school district that meets the needs of all students. And I would go ahead and design something without those parameters. It's really hard for me to create something that I could then fund, right? So part of this process was creating parameters to build this design within a kind of a frame that was semi close to what we think we could support. Um, so the additional 2.5, I mean, I'm, I'm fully supportive of. Okay. And, that's and think it, it makes sense. Um, okay, well, that's that's all I wanted to hear because I agree. I mean, to me, this model sounds very, very good, Chris. I, you know, I it sounds good. So I just didn't know, you know, given what had been said before, how you felt about that. So great, thanks. Maria. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wondered, Chris, if you could talk about, you had mentioned um, the sixth grade language um, person being dual certified um, to give kids an uh, introduction into both French and Spanish. Gosh, I think that's a great idea, um, but I wondered if there'd been any discussion with elementary principals doing that earlier since we have our kids starting Spanish earlier, why wouldn't we be introducing them? I just wondered pedagogically what you're... So, Victoria, we haven't yet had a conversation with the elementary about this. Our thought process in it was um, by the seventh grade year in the MYP, students need to pick a language that they're going to be with um, through um, a particular level in the MYP. And in doing so right now with students in the elementary level only having access to Spanish, we wanted to make sure that, um, that we had students have an exposure to both Spanish and French in order to make that decision because then they're going to be taking that language for several more years afterward. Um, in terms of whether or not it that sort of a model of dual certification and multiple language exposure at an earlier level were to come in, um, finding dually certified language teachers can be a challenge anyway. Um, but you know, many, many IB districts adopt one language for elementary and then do this sort of a thing, this carousel piece at the start of MYT to give exposure to multiple languages. And so we went with that to, to hopefully allow students a chance to feel much more of a knowledgeable stance in their choice rather than right now going, well, I've taken Spanish, I'll, uh, I'll take French because I don't know anything about it, or I'm going to stay with Spanish because I don't know anything about it. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, I just question. Um, can you hear me? 
Yep. Okay. Um, could you talk a little bit about on that Wednesday, you have the enrichment classes. What, what did, could you talk a little about what that is? Um, it's an opportunity for teachers to teach something about which they feel passionate and that they have the, the knowledge and experience to, to give um, a class to teach students something completely different. For example, um, we had a teacher propose the idea of teaching a playwriting seminar. Um, a, a teacher who teaches writing all the time, but based upon our unit plans as they stand right now, they don't actually delve into writing plays. And that students during that time could have the opportunity to learn how to write plays and write them themselves. Um, we talked about other types of exploratories, um, you know, based upon outdoor adventure learning or, um, you know, all sorts of different things to really try to pique the interest of students in different ways. Great, that's what I'm looking for. I think that's, I think that's fabulous. Thank you. Other questions? Other questions? Great. Um, so one other thing I wanted to do while, um, while Andrew's on is introduce him virtually and then maybe in person at some other time um, to the board. So Andrew Conforti is our interim principal at, at MOMS, doing a great job. Um, still, still has a lifeline to Chris and is connected um, and is on the ground. Um, lots of great energy. Andrew, anything you want to share? Yes, I'm grateful to still have Chris back there. Um, but uh, yeah, um, just one thought I just had based on that last comment is we're even looking at, you imagine in this schedule where you don't see the flex blocks that currently exist and all that. Um, right now in the hybrid model, we're actually kind of exploring those ideas right now and trying to cultivate some teacher interest in, in looking and engaging our kids in a, in a thoughtful and creative way to get them outside and get them moving, engaging them in, in the time that we have. Um, and, you know, other things that came up as it relates to this year is there is a lot going on for our teachers and uh, in the age of COVID with all the unknowns, they continue to really put their best foot forward and looking at this, you know, the next steps as Chris talked about in staffing, you're just trying to come up with a timeline for them and just the process for how are we gonna roll this out together as a group, um, working with Courtney Cron and the IB and, and making sure that creating a framework even to think about building units in a way that we can share um, and, and, and collaborate and getting us ready to bring the sixth grade. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm grateful for the opportunity, even though we do miss having Chris in the building and, and other staff that have been forced out, uh, you know, as a matter of, you know, difficult choices that have to make on behalf of their family and other reasons. I'm grateful for the opportunity and, and really happy to be at MUMS. Um, so thanks for the opportunity. And I'd like to thank the, the two longest lasting members of our committee, Barbie and Alana, have been tireless in their, their uh, devotion to this project. Uh, Lisa Maggio as well, Amy Pfeiffer last year, Evie Gray, who unfortunately left us to go to People's Academy. Now Lauren Daly and Darcy and Nino have joined us. But the, the um, when you saw how complicated that schedule was, imagine that on about 80 different pieces of chart paper spread all over a room. And we did have to eat a fair amount of dark chocolate on that day to see what we could figure out. But they, Barbie and Alana and Lisa Maggio have just been incredible in this process. Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, you know, middle school is, it's, it is a gem. Um, in the educational process, uh, especially here in this district. And those are tough years for kids as they're trying to figure all this stuff out. And the way that you bring empathy and care to it is greatly appreciated. So thank you very much. Okay.
So thanks again. Um, so the next the next agenda item is enrollment numbers. I'd like to um, request that we postpone this to our next meeting. Um, we're we're still working on some final pieces that came up today that we want to iron out before we bring the final final numbers to the board. Okay. So uh, I'd like to put that on to our next meeting. Super. So next up then is report of the board and we're going to go to an update from Victoria on the facilities master plan. Victoria. Great. Um, well, let's see. Since uh, our last meeting, um, Mary and I have been to three different porch conversations um, in Weybridge on the 30th. Uh, Ripton on the 1st and Shoreham on the 7th. Um, Peter joined us in Ripton. Um, and, you know, some tough conversations, but uh, it feels good to be out in the community and really uh, the, the format really allows for exchange that we don't get um, in these types of meetings. Uh, so that's been really great. I think they've been productive conversations. Um, I think that the community, or I hope that the community who has participated have felt um, heard and, and had some of their answer, their questions answered. Um, we've had some board members come, um, which has been great. And, and um, I encourage anybody uh, who hasn't to to come to one of the next few, um, <clears throat> just to get a feel for um, the questions that are, are being asked and, <clears throat> and that sort of thing. Um, before I move on from that, and Mary, do you want to add, add anything about porch conversations? No, um, I don't know if anybody who's attended wants to add anything to, it'd be interesting to get your perspective on it. I'll say a few things. Um, okay, I've been to a couple, and I would have to say the communities are really well versed in what they and they've done a lot of research. And so some of the questions are um, challenging. And I would say Mary and Victoria do an amazing job holding, uh, responding in a very respectful, but uh, a way in which it moves the needle a little bit and helps the community think about. The, the situation that we're in. So my hat's off to you guys. You've done an amazing job with that. Um, so I would encourage people to come too. It's very enlightening. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a primarily a Middlebury person, but it is really important to go to the outlying communities to listen to the passion and the, the concerns that they have and then talk through it with them. So I felt like Every time I left one of the meetings, there was a positive, a more positive tone between the community and the board. So I think it's been great. Any other comments? Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, they have been very valuable. Um, I think that there is also this, sometimes there's this uh, notion that the folks in towns where right now they believe that their school is going to close have this single-minded perspective of, I just want to figure out a way to keep my school open. And I don't think that that, I think it's been demonstrated that that's not always, that's not necessarily true all the time. Um, yes, sometimes that is a perspective, but there's many folks and, We've met them and chatted with them who are truly trying to think about how do we solve for what we're so trying to solve for here and do so in a way that recognizes our resources, recognizes our opportunities and our challenges and allows us to impact in a positive way all our kids in this community. And you got to respect that. You really got to respect that. And it's been, um, they, like Victoria said, they're hard conversations, but uh, so important. And so hats off to 
Amy and the communications committee who's helped support it, creating all these and board members who have come out, we really appreciate it. And the community who's taken the time to organize and do the research and be informed and, and put themselves out there and participate for crying out loud. <laughs> You know, it's just, it's wonderful and inspiring to see, even though it's under very difficult circumstances. And so for that, I'm super grateful. Yep. And uh, on, on that note, um, <clears throat> I hope you all read, um, I, know, I know most of you have, um, the proposal from Shoreham, which I just wanna say, I know took many, many hours and lots of analysis and collaboration of folks um, in Shoreham and um, we really appreciate the thought um, and really hard work that went into that um, and it is certainly impacting the questions that we're asking um, and how we're framing discussion going forward. Um, and is, is certainly um, become, you know, one of the inputs into this um, process. Um, so the work over the next um, few weeks to a month, I guess, is primarily around um, the transportation and um, what is the, what, what's that going to look like in a three school model. Um, Brittany is the lead at the moment in engaging the transportation consultant um, to take a deeper dive into the specifics of transporting students in the three school model. Um, we're diving into the boundaries um, and we'll also be looking at school choice. Um, as we've stated before, this um, will be critical in figuring out whether the three, three school model will work um, from a logistics perspective um, and how it would compare to a four, to four school model um, logistically. Um, I know we've gotten a number of questions, Brittany, I'm gonna put you on the spot here, um, about who the transportation consultant is. I wondered if you could speak just for a moment um, about the process of finding someone and, and who the person is. Yeah, so the consultant, his name is Tim Ammons. Um, he's part of a company called Decision Support Group. Um, I made contact with him um, a couple of years ago at a conference. Um, he was engaged with a different company at the time um, that was solely focused on transportation solutions. The, the firm that he's with now is, um, is a bit more broad in scope, but they do a lot of work with transportation and they also look at things like boundary lines and um, you know operational solutions. Great. Thank you. Uh, Was there a question? Sure. Sorry. No. Okay. Um, he I think is based in Massachusetts okay. now. Um thank you. So uh, this week we're getting um, the dates squared away for the next facilities meeting, but I think it'll be November 18th or thereabouts. Um, and during that is when we'll be discussing and hearing from the transportation consultant um, about his modeling. Um, and then we hope to share that work with the full board um, at that very next full board meeting, which is, I believe, on the 23rd. Um, and I think that's what I've got. Peter, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think, you know, Brittany and I are working um, to kind of bring together the next iteration of what we need um, for the next meeting. and. Um, as you mentioned, I think the transportation and the mapping is is the next big thing for us to do to to now really look at. You know, we've got to this point, we've um, identified these three schools. Now the the next question is, does that work? How does it work? 
um, and continue to problem solve as we go forward. Great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, next up, draft policy. Mary. Okay. Um, so we would like to um, put out for discussion the um, prevention of sexual harassment, which is the Title IX draft policy, which was created by the VSBA. Um, they, this, this policy has to be adopted as is. There's no uh, room for changing anything. Um, and so we just, it's very long, it's very lengthy. Uh, it takes a lot of reading to go through it. Um, Vicki, as the coordinator, do you wanna have anything to say about your title? Nine. Um, it is a it is a long policy. Um, it was written um, in collaboration with Visbit by Heather and Pietro Lynn, who are our two um, legal counsels anyway that we utilize. They are at this point in time the experts in the state of Vermont. They are the ones who are doing all of the training necessary for us to get up to speed with Title IX. Um, and and Visbit has put this out as a model policy for um, for us through um, the VSBA. So it is detailed, mm -hmm. and I would just my recommendation would be just as as we move it forward, leave it as completely as is. We yeah. we shouldn't touch it. Sure. <clears throat> you know, I, I researched it a little bit. I knew we couldn't touch it, but <laughs> yeah, uh, with all the stuff federally, okay, from the Department of Education relative to college right and title nine it was sort of interesting looking at some of the uh, what, what had happened and from what i from what i gather because i think it's a, you, we can pay up, no problem with accepting it but i think board should understand a little bit about what it all means and i think what i could gather from and i, I pulled up a few things just for my own edification as to an early read from some legal company that was online too, but they've really narrowed, they've organized it more and they have narrowed the definitions to some degree. I mean, even to the point of saying, uh, if if the complaint happened in Italy on the school trip, it's not relevant right. to you, okay? Because it's not in the United States, yeah. that's right in there. Right. I said, geez, that caught my eye. but. I, I don't know whether it makes it more difficult or less difficult for administrators or complaints, actually, uh, or the person who's being complained about. Uh, it's very, I tried reading it. I, I, I said, thank God I'm not a legislator. I'd have to read an 800 page bill by tomorrow because it's going to change everything. You can't read it. It's yeah. just, it's, it's a lots of legal. Yeah. Oh, lots of well, there's a definition of a definition of a definition. I mean, it goes on. <laughs> it's, it's a much more um, judicial process than oh. what we usually right. do. Um, it is. It has many more people involved than what we usually have. Um, the timelines are are extended for a number of things. So logistically, it could continue for months. Um, and there's you know there's the coordinator. There's the initial reporter, there's the investigator, then there's a decision maker, and then there's potentially a grievance, and then there's potentially a final decision maker. So it's a it's a it's a much more onerous process. And I've been through a six-hour training twice. And by the second time, I was like, okay, I think I have, I, I think I'm getting this. And and I could not by any means explain the, the whole thing. At any I'm point not asking you yeah. to. <laughs> but, but from no, the point, it's, it's, it's really honest, long because yeah. it's really yes. complicated. Yes. Uh, it's an important subject, but it's also, I, I, I'm not sure it's made worse, but it's it's just, it's really hard to get your hands around it. So I would think that the district, when we have the passes, you know, if not already, was going to come up with a hierarchy of people who are not memorize the whole thing, but are really pretty, pretty solid on how to do this because what impressed me about it was everybody can get into trouble for this. Right? <laughs> really? 
I mean, not just the person who has supposedly been harassed, right? But how it's how but it's everybody else in the system can be blasted because they aren't doing what they're right. supposed to be doing. Right. And uh, if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, then how do you know you should be doing? It? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the same people who, um, Heather and Pietro, who, who worked on the, um, the policy, are also working with Visbit to develop a toolkit for administrators to help us walk through the process, multiple checklists, and other and other pieces. Um, and so you're, you're right, there needs to be at least five or six of us in district who are right. well read That's what I mean. with this policy. I, yeah. I know you will be, but I'm just making a point, and it's, it was worth it was worth my looking at it, trying to read it, going online, pulling on some other stuff, getting a perspective of what it was to say, whoa. Yeah. So I, I, have, I don't know who's got the answer to this, but at the, as to Chip's point, at the federal level, specifically in this area, politics has gotten involved. Sure. Yeah, is, absolutely. Is that <laughs> the case at the K-12 level? And if so, what are what's like the recourse or help me understand? So the yeah the what I was going to say is um, ASA, which is the Association of yeah. School Superintendents National Association, which is kind of like the lead on K twelve issues yeah. um, on the federal front, was vehemently opposed to this change. This to came, this to this Title Nine change. Right. Yes. Um, this came from DeVos. Yeah. And probably, and everyone connected to her. Yeah. Um, you know the the implications are, and this was a response to the dear colleague letter. Yeah. Which was a at had had, um, which impacted higher ed, right? Mm -hmm. This impacts K twelve as well. So that's yeah. that's the difference. What you're talking about. This does impact yeah. us. Um, so that we've had to now we are now in the process of learning an entirely new system we have to respond differently now um, it's as vicky said it's much more judicial and litigious mm -hmm. and it puts school districts in the position of having to um, almost kind of like run a case as if we were a court of law that was right. my that was my and first is, is the same consequence in k-12 you know they have sticks in higher ed for those who should, who want to make a different statement. Is that the case here in K twelve as well? Like it's this or you're going to get all the. No, we can't. We can't change any of the other laws related to expulsion or or anything like that. It's it's more about what how we kind of decide what it is. We kind of like make a decision on the case in terms of what happens to students. As a consequence, none of that. I mean, that's what we. Yeah, no, I mean the. That. I mean the process. Like, is if you say no, I don't want to adopt this policy because I think this is a politically right. influenced we, policy and blah blah blah, whatever. What happens? It's a good question. I don't know. I, I think what happens? A lot of times, whether we adopt it or not, we're still we're still going to be bound by. Because yeah. of the other. I mean, we're yeah, open yeah. To, okay, that yeah. was my question. Yeah, because it's federal okay. legislation yeah. at this yeah. point. And, and what's interesting is even with this, if something doesn't rise to the level under the Title IX, we still have the HHP policies and procedures yeah. that we have to go with. Okay. All right. So, Mayor, we have to read this and then we're going to put it on read the document. Read it and we'll adopt it in Super. one of our future meetings. Okay. Okay. And then the second policy is, uh, we talked about this a couple of times, the electronic communication between employees and students. We tried to look at changing the draft a little bit. The um, BSBA said we can't change it. So now it is back to the original uh, BSBA model. <laughs> and we, yeah, take we, a vote. we just need to take a vote on it, okay. adopt it. So can I get a motion then on this? In motion, we approve the electronic communications between employees and students. Great, can I get a second? I'll second it. Great, thanks, Suzanne. Any further discussion? I'll just say I'm not the only squeaky wheel in the state. This made the paper last yes, year, too, that another school board had a very long I, conversation. I, I just, attend, just randomly, I was talking to that superintendent, like, wait, wait, that happened to us. Yeah, right, it was just happened to us. 
<laughs> it was so funny. Was like, and I, we had actually uh, contacted them also about, uh, there was a, a section in there that says a, a family member is exempt from making inappropriate remarks. And we're like, how can that be okay? But we couldn't change it. So we are where we are. I we think, are where we are. I think okay. The thing we so, can do is we have the two most, we have the first and second. All those in favor, say aye or raise your hand. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Great, so moved. The last bit of conversation on that, if, if I may, yeah. I have mentioned to Mary, you know, our job is to adopt the policy, right? But the school district right. works on procedures. And so it, the, the, the administrators have made it clear that their intention is not to penalize a student for checking in with an instructor you know, after hours. And so perhaps if, if while procedures are being written, there's maybe something made clear um, about what, what, how you see this policy um, being enacted might be helpful for me to stomach this policy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jen, and I appreciate your, mm -hmm. your perseverance on this one, I really do. <laughs> um, so we did the other action. Um, we do have an other that I just wanted to touch base on. A couple of folks have asked for us to discuss and consider uh, going back to fully remote as a board meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I wanted to honor that request and put that out there and get people's thoughts on it. Uh, so if you have a idea or position and want to share that now, that would be awesome. And just raise your hand to- I, I still would I stand with my original, but I think we should be here. I understand why people do not want to be here, uh, but I do think that uh, I just I still stand that way. I will go with obviously we'll go with any way people want to do, but still. Peter C. Uh, thanks. This is the first meeting I've attended uh, remotely, and um, I just will say that uh, it seems like a lot of the kinks have been worked out. The audio is good. Um, the video the camera pointing at the people who are speaking works really well. It also helps the audio. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to stay hybrid wise. I, I think it is good for us to be there. Um, but I also sort of, it's a complicated, cumbersome process to set it all up and run it. Um, and that's certainly worth considering. I would just say um, I think it's important that we have students that are in the classroom um, and we have students that are remote. Um, so I think demonstrating um, both, I think ideally is something to really think about um, as well um, while we're still in um, our current phase. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you. Thank you. Other comments? I'm with Chip. I'd go either way, but I really do think the in-person getting together is helpful. Betty? I think um, maintaining the hybrid gives people a choice whether to, um, you know, for whatever reason they cannot make it in person, um, still attend. Um, and once we figure out how to make the technology work, I think it's the better option, in my opinion. Um, um, one other thing, if yeah. the transmission in the state starts to, of uh, COVID, you know, starts to spiral out of control, obviously we would Absolutely. go totally remote, yeah. but where we are right where now. Where we are right now, that's the, yeah. Any other comments? You have one comment. Victor oh, Victoria? No, I, I would agree with, um, you know, what's been said. I, I, I think the in-person is important, both from a optics point of view and also just, I think it facilitates a better conversation. Um, having said that, this is my first time doing remote and I, I think tech-wise, it's I, it hasn't been a problem at all. Um, the sound is great. I could see the presentations. Um, you know, I, I feel like I'm able to participate. So, you know, I, I would agree with Kyle that while we're in hybrid, I think the hybrid option is a good call. Peter? Can I thank Will for making it? Thank you, Will. Thank you, Will. You did it. <laughs> just write it all down so you can do it. <laughs> all right. So, oh, go ahead, Jen, sorry. I was wondering if there were if there were other reasons why folks wanted to 
to remote? Was it mostly the technical piece or were there some other things that we should consider? I was just asked to put it on as a discussion point. So if folks want to share those other okay. reasons, I'm not, you know, uh, yeah, I was asked to. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Three of the six on remote are Middlebury people though. So I see that. So they have different reasons. Obviously. It's not just distance. So I think for as long as it sounds like hybrid is the way to go, best of both worlds. We're we've done an amazing, Will's done an amazing job of, of moving us forward from a technology perspective. We recognize that for whatever personal circumstances, folks are making decisions that work for them as they should. And we want to honor that. And there is value in being here in person. And so why don't we continue with hybrid? Okay? Great. Can I make one other comment that Absolutely. came up in the news, which I thought was important, for it had to do with uh, the fact that there's not been a lot of data that the COVID has been passed through school, school population in the studies that have done all over the place. Yeah. Now, obviously, Vermont is at this point, because the numbers are low, probably consistent with that, but in places where the numbers are high, they haven't seen that happening. So that you know, that to me is heartening <laughs> to know that uh, right. even if, in fact, as you say, the numbers will go up, which they, I think, know that yeah, will by the nature right. of everything that's happening around us and mm -hmm. you know, within, uh, maybe within the school community, but they're still controlled in a way that I hope so. Yeah, yeah. No, we've had a couple of positive tests as of today, not here. But in Vermont, we had uh, South Burlington, uh, Williston, and um, Essex had one case the other way. Peter, are they high school or elementary? Uh, one, one's elementary, I think one's a K-8, and one's high school. Okay. And were they staff or kids? I believe they were students, but okay. I, I don't have all of them. Yeah, I didn't know if they were okay. staying there or not. I'm not positive, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, yeah, does anyone have any others for other? <laughs> no? Oh, oh, hey, oh sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, um, being that, you know, right now we're taking advantage of teachers and schools are taking advantage of outdoor, you know, classrooms with this nice, beautiful weather. <laughs> um, can you give us a sneak peek on <laughs> what to expect for the winter? Um, you know, with now with full um, integration of K to six kids back in school free, um, are they going to continue outdoor learning? Experience? Yeah, that's what the that's, that's the plan. Um, yeah. They're I mean they put the skirts on the tents oh. to to keep them warm. So a lot of them are in kind of places where they'll get warm from the sun. So I, I think there's a, a real move afoot to continue, even when it gets cold, to continue to go outside. And, and students are going outside all the time anyway for recess and other things like that. So I think it's really been interesting to watch this develop over the last two months. And um, students love it, uh, teachers love it. I, you know, when I drive by a school, I, I always see classes outside. When I went to Mary Hogan this morning, um, three or four classes, the, the younger grades were, were outside in the Hawk Zone and other places doing different things. And I brought these little squares that they sit on in the classroom that they brought out and we're all meeting together. So it, it, I think it's, a, it's, it's continuing to develop, but I, every school is talking about continuing through the winter. Obviously, we're changing it slightly, right, as it gets cold and um, and things like that, but continuing with that commitment. Great. Wonderful. <laughs> Any other others? One other. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, so the sixth grade move, um, you know, with the new plan, uh, the new model, is that something that will be brought to the public for discussion or is it, um, uh, is it that once they make up, once they conclude, you know, on what model to go with, that's going to be the final thing? 
I think all these things are pretty iterative just in terms of even a year by year. Um, I mean, generally when any school is making, creating a plan, an educational plan and staffing it, they don't tend to ask the public, do you want two nurses or one nurse or, do you know what I mean? Like it, it's, it's highly um, integrated in terms of thinking about each staffing position and how it relates overall to the whole. Um, I think that being said, I think that the main place that the public will engage in this model is, is probably going to be through our budget process, which is coming up really soon, where we'll be talking about this again, you know, as we go into school budgets. And that's really, I think, the place, um, you know, historically, annually, that the public come in and talk about you know, I know moms has created this plan and you're staffing these positions and this, you know, I, we feel strongly that there needs to be more focus on X, Y, or Z. That's the place where we can kind of get feedback and, and kind of integrate that as, as appropriate. Great. Anything else? All right, thank you all very, very much. Appreciate it. Have a, a motion to adjourn. Um, <laughs> Great, motion to adjourn. Take the team. Take the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for the, uh, well done. Thank you.